2002, BAN, the Basel Action Network, uncovered a dirty little secret of the high-tech industry. BAN's documentary film, Exporting Harm, revealed that electronic waste, such as scrap computers, is in fact hazardous waste, and that as much as 80% of the growing mountains of hazardous e-waste collected for recycling in wealthy, developed countries is instead exported to Asia. Through the convenience of a global e-waste trade, the electronics industry has been able to avoid responsibility for the impacts of their toxic products, and has instead been able to pass these hazards and their costs off to some of the world's poorest communities and workers in destinations like China or India. There, the toxic electronic scrap is melted, burned, treated with corrosive and toxic acids, and dumped. Studies have since shown that these exports are resulting in very serious contamination. And now, three years after uncovering the high-tech trashing of Asia, BAN's investigative team crosses a shaky bridge over the digital divide to witness increasing amounts of electronic wastes arriving in Africa. Exports of electronic hand-me-downs have been justified by many as a source of needed repair and recycling jobs in developing countries, in turn helping to extend the life of products and also serving as a bridge over the digital divide, enabling access to the information age. However, at the same time, officials in developing countries are increasingly voicing concern that much of what is being exported to them is not functional or reusable, or very quickly becomes obsolete, leaving a rapidly growing legacy of toxic waste that burdens the poorest communities, lacking any infrastructure to deal with it. Ban traveled to Nigeria to better understand the truth between these two different views. The second largest city in the world and Africa's most populous city, Lagos, Nigeria, is experienced as overwhelming, overgrown, and overburdened, but a dynamic hotbed of entrepreneurial spirit in a country rapidly becoming hardwired to the information age. No place better exemplifies the latest global trends in the e-waste trade than the massive computer and electronics markets found in Lagos. And nowhere is the love affair with electronic goods, both new and used, more apparent than in the Icasia Computer Village. Here, in what until recently was a residential neighborhood, the Computer Village comprises six hectares with thousands of small businesses that sell, repair, and service anything from imported scrap computers to pirated software to brand new equipment. So this is Otigba Street. It all started here about 10 years ago. We have close to about 4,000 registered members here, and we have them coming here day in, day out. ICT industry is growing in Nigeria and it is happening here within the computer village. Talk of anything computer, you get it here. We are going digital. While the Computer Association likes to emphasize its new products, a vast majority of the computer village's business deals with used equipment, mostly imported from Europe and North America. A remarkably well-trained and educated, yet very low-waged labor force provides an impressive ability to repair and remarket the imported equipment. It has grown tremendously over the, the years. As I started on the street there, from the grass truth, but at least I have a big place now. I went through the university for about six years, and I studied physics and electronics. So that gives me a hedge in the job. Most handsets, most sets, we can work on them here. Uh, yeah, most of the phones that come here are off the ship. Okay. You see, here, most phones that come into Nigeria here are used handsets or contract uh, handsets from abroad. We have importers, we have some markets in Nigeria here where people bring in a large quantity, 10,000, 20,000 pieces. So we are the service end for them. We have some, some of our brothers staying here in overseas like in US, in Germany, United Kingdom, Italy, Holland. So they go to warehouses over there and buy some used products there and they put it back into, into the country. Most of them coming, home, coming from overseas, they have been overused them over there. It's been overused. So even the colors are so brownish that nobody can buy it. 
So we end up spending money again buying paint and spraying machine to put them back in shape to make them look better. Yeah. Our customers don't know about that. Uh, they think they might be new. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like this one now. The switch is not working very well. Which was bad. The switch is very bad. If we have up to 100 pieces, really? by God's grace, we get up to 75. Yeah, you can take. Uh, yes, if you open up a container, since they bought it non-tested from overseas, you are trying your luck. Before leaving the computer village, Ban went back to the Computer Dealers Association office to ask the beneficiaries of the burgeoning second-hand electronics trade just how serious was this problem of imported, obsolete, junk electronics? I will tell you that we have greater percentage of those that cannot be used than those that can be used. Uh, honestly speaking, I would say 75% of these items are not usable. The control is supposed to be from the international community where these things are coming from. If they know they, they, who has the facility to control these junks, allow this thing to come to Africa country that have no facilities, then this is all uh, wickedness. If the third world countries have been allowed as a dumping ground for items that are full of toxicity, then we are not helping the world. It is, it is to me, inhumanity to man. The investigative team asked Mr. Oboro where the dealers obtained the imported used equipment. He directed them to large wholesale warehouses and yards near the port where the containers first arrive after clearing customs. No, 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 there are other warehouses in Lagos, there are other warehouses. There are, there are dotted all over Lagos. Uh, but, but, but this one is the most popular, the most known, and the biggest. In all of Lagos, I would guess about 500 containers of computers are uploaded monthly. The computer revolution, let me use that word, is just coming to play in, in Nigeria. Uh, it is just this year we even started receiving computers in large quantities. In each of the consignments, uh, depending on how it is loaded, we, we have uh, an average of about uh, 800 pieces. 800 pieces, that's a complete computer set. There are still a lot of junks. How can they? There are a lot of junks in Lagos, and uh, uh, if nobody buys them, they get thrown away or used for, use for spare parts. At the warehouses, the fate of much of the unmarketable imports was revealed. This equipment is seen as worthless even here in Lagos, and without recycling destinations, piles up in cavernous warehouses gathering dust. And just outside the gates, dumpsters were found laden with rejected e-waste scrap. Mr. Ogenekaro was asked if he would like to see laws or standards to ensure exports were functional and of high quality. Definitely, I want the country where these goods are coming from to at least give the us, the developing nation, working items. We should not be classed as a dumping nation where you bring anything that is not good, you come and throw them here in Nigeria. No. I want them to give us things that is working, things that they will use in their, in their own country should be what they should export to other countries. Just treat us like one of them. I employ the government of, that, of each of these countries where they export from to kindly monitor the items and let us as well be happy. While the investigative team again witnessed the open cracking of cathode ray tubes to uncover copper from the yolks, unlike the situation in China, there was little other evidence in Nigeria of efforts to recover and recycle materials such as plastics, steel, aluminum, and precious metals. So where did the waste go? The word on the street was that if it was not repairable, it was simply thrown away. The dumpsters located inside the computer village and in many other open markets began to provide a clue. These trash bins are filled each day and trucked to local dumps. In Lagos, official dump sites and countless more informal roadside or wayside dumps abound. None are sanitary, lined, or monitored, and all rest on top of Lagos's very high water table. And these dumps, 
both formal and informal, are routinely set ablaze to reduce accumulating volumes of trash. It would be difficult to locate each of these scattered dumps throughout Lagos, and even more difficult to quantify the total amount of e-wastes thrown away each day. But a closer look at just a few dumps found outside the markets exposed the horrible face of uncontrolled e-waste importation and management in Nigeria. In numerous dumps wedged between residential apartments or tossed into swampy waysides, the imported techno trash was simply dumped and set afire. This is what's happening with the waste that cannot be recycled. This is outside, just on the outskirts of the Laba market, the electronics market here in Lagos, Nigeria. This material is being picked over by scavengers to get the last bit of value from the material. Metals, copper, the wires will be burnt to extract the copper. This whole pile here, is, they tell us, is going to be burnt very soon to reduce the volume of it. It's routine that this happens. They'll light it on fire and it'll burn down into the swamp here. Uh, we see computers, carcasses here. We see television carcasses from all over the world, from Germany, from USA, from Japan. And this is their final resting place here in Lagos, Nigeria. I have problem because when they burn all this, I know that the chemicals are not good for human health. The tube, the plastics are not good. So we have complained over time, but nobody's helping us out. It's not difficult to learn the identities of those that are careless or who care less about the eventual impacts of their techno trash. Brand names and institutional asset tags remain on the equipment. But even when the tags have been peeled off, it can be shocking to find out what might be hidden below the surface. As part of the investigation into the origins of this waste, BAN purchased hard drives to look deeper, and by so doing raised new questions of responsibility, even beyond the concern about toxic dumping. Here in Lagos, we've been going from market to market and uh, finding interesting uh, computers. When we find them, we have the hard drives removed, and we're now going to ship these off to Switzerland for forensic examination. Guido Rodolfi of Netmon, a cyber investigative service located in Zurich, Switzerland, stood ready to receive and examine the drives. Well, Netmon provides investigative service for the information age. So basically what we are doing, we are recovering data which is on hard drives like those. Well, we are working for banks, insurance companies, but also for governmental agencies, be it here in Switzerland or in other countries. Well, Ben did send us all those hard drives which you see here and asked us if we could find something on them. And that was basically our role. It's child's play to recover them. And so after only a little bit of, of time that you have to invest, you can find a lot, a tremendous lot of data on those files from the former users. Well, what I'm looking at are documents which we found on a computer. Here you have the letterhead from the World Bank. You just could fill in a name and the text. Here we see a very private email that was sent well, actually, it was a lady who was working at the World Bank, and at some point, they did this pose of her computer. And she most probably didn't have any idea what is happening with the data that she had on her hard drive, with her letters, very private emails. So they were sent over to Nigeria. Their band did pick them up and did send them over to Switzerland. And so here I am reading her emails. For the companies, it's very risky. They cannot track back what data they are uh, distributing all over the world. That's a list of children which were taken into protective custody by the government. And I can see which the name of the children, the name of the parents. Maybe the children don't even know the names of their parents. I see how much money they get. Actually, that's data which is absolutely and highly confidential for the care of those kids. So it should keep confidential. And I would do everything if I were a relative of those kids to make sure it's kept confidential. Obviously, the government doesn't do that job. Before leaving Nigeria, Ban wanted to hear the opinions of the Nigerian experts about what they had discovered. 
The first stop was the Basel Convention Regional Center at the University of Ibadan, two hours outside of Lagos. Director of the Basel Center, Professor Oladeli Osibanjo, had been one of the early investigators of an earth-shaking event in 1988, the dumping of a boatload of Italian toxic waste at Cocoa Beach, Nigeria. That incident created an international furor, which culminated in the creation of the 1989 Basel Convention, the UN Treaty designed to minimize production and trade of toxic waste. Professor Osibanjo had recently engaged his chemistry students to analyze the toxicity of electronics. Ban in turn showed the professor pictures taken outside of the Lagos markets just days before to get his reaction. Well, let me thank you for making this visit because I, I was not even aware we had uh, uh, another disaster behind our backyard, just like the cocoa waste was sitting there. You know, it's a time bomb because I was shocked to see these tons, heaps of uh, uh, electronic waste. And of course, people believe out of sight is out of mind. Burn it off and it disappears. Of course, you know, you're only changing from solid to gaseous phase. It still causes the same problem. So I was quite shocked. And it's an eye opener. The gases are very hazardous. They are obnoxious. They contain toxic components. They are quite carcinogenic substances. And the problem you will find now that uh, the incidence of uh, such terrible disease like cancer is very high now in Nigeria. And of course, the challenges from this, our ex existing regulations, and that's all, it does not cover its waste. The problem with African countries is they ratify these conventions, but they don't domesticate the laws. So even when you sign the Basel, it's not in the laws of Nigeria. So there have to be a uh, review of the existing legislation, and moreover, uh, massive public awareness. There appeared to be widespread agreement in Nigeria of a need for greater controls to prevent useless, hazardous e-wastes from entering the country. But what about the role that could be played by second-hand equipment in bridging the digital divide? Ban met Sheena Badaru, the founder and editor of Nigeria's Technology Times, to hear his views on the subject. Uh, with respect to the raging debate about the digital divide, it's, it's a compelling uh, issue that Africa has to contend with. Even though there is widespread poverty, there is widespread uh, hunger, the issues of conflict, the issues about uh, governance and democratization, it's equally a compelling issue because out there the world is not waiting for you. The, the businesses are done online, the payment systems are electronic today and uh, the internet is profoundly and fundamentally change how we live, how we work, and every single thing that we do. But Mr. Badaru took issue with those who claimed the IT gap might be solved through the importation of used equipment. What Africa needs as a, sta as a start off is the ability to be able to evolve its own information technology industry, to support its own local system builders, to be able to evolve its own local computers, to be able to write software code in its own local languages, to meet its own local need, and system that should also be priced and made affordable to the local uh, consumers. There's actually an evolving IT industry in Africa. It's, it's just been bogged down basically by the fact that the local industry, the local players have huge challenges with access to funding. That is what Africa needs. Africa does not need the used equipment coming in from the north to come in here and continue to pose long-term, long-term environmental threat to our environment. There's two stories to be told here. One is blatant dumping, people loading up containers full of stuff they know is not useful. It's going to end up as waste, it's going to be burned, it's going to be dumped in swamps here in Lagos or in other cities in Africa. That has got to stop. And unfortunately we've heard that that's about 75% of the goods coming in, or the so-called goods coming in. On the other hand, we also feel that reuse is paramount. It is much better to make something last long, it's better for the environment, get the most life out of a product you can. We absolutely believe we need to make this dividing line between the legitimate trade 
and the illegitimate dumping very clear. And we got to err on the side of protecting the environment, if there's any doubt. The framework for making this dividing line is the Basel Convention. It already exists, and we have got to take leadership within that treaty to make it very clear what's going to be considered a hazardous waste and therefore controlled, and what is going to be considered a commodity and not controlled. Yeah, we need more controls because if there are no controls, then the convention is not working. It just becomes a paper tiger, and that's not the purpose, that's not the intention. Governments, in particular the United States, are failing to enforce international law by not requiring the proper testing and labeling of the scrap prior to shipment to make certain it's not just more toxic waste dumped yet again on Africa. According to the Basel Convention, every generator of waste is responsible for its own waste. Becoming responsible actually means first and foremost to start way upstream to design our products to be clean, toxic free, and that our industries are clean. When you are poor, you accept anything. That's what is happening. I don't believe that alleviating poverty is a justification for poisoning people. I just don't believe it. As adults, we should not go from developed to developing. And like in anything, if there's no monitoring, things can go wrong. So uh, the exporting country must put in strict controls and follow their own regulatory regime. And if we are talking of a global village, a common future, a common destiny for all the peoples of the world, it is only fair and morally right to be sure that all sides uh, are safe at the end of the day. Oh, 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 oh,